Okay, all right, sorry for the delay. So um, I'm just gonna give a, uh, a general presentation of Tezos. Uh, there's gonna be a more specific presentation about uh, different aspects of the project and the code base, but I just wanna give you a general overview of what the project is and what problem it's trying to solve and how it's trying to solve it. Uh, and I think I have two hours, so uh, I'm gonna try to uh, uh, keep you awake for these two hours and, uh, and, and leave some time at the end for, uh, for questions because it's always better because you, you, know, you, know what, what, you know what you don't know, I don't know what you don't know. So uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's better if you, uh, if you ask me directly. Okay, so I'm gonna try this clicker. My hopes are low. Okay, so that doesn't work. That, that seems to work, okay. Uh, that's just a table of content that doesn't field in the Beamer slide. All right, so I'm gonna start with money because uh, these things are cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies try to be money and I'm gonna give you a quick um, historical and theoretical perspective on money. Uh, so first the role of money and so classically in economics you give uh, three different roles to money. One is a store of value. You would like money to maintain value over time. Right? So you want to be able to save uh, for future consumption. You have money now, you don't want to spend it right away. You want to spend it next year, and next year you still want it to have value. So that's a store of value aspect. The other one is a mean of exchange. So you have a can of tomato soup, and I have some money, and I, and I pay you, and you pay me the can. And so that's slightly different, but it's also tied. You know, it's a store of value. Why does it store value? Well, because I will be able to use it uh, to, buy, uh, to buy goods. So that's the mean of exchange aspect of, uh, of money. And the third one is uh, unit of accounts. So you can price things in money, you can enter contracts, you can have wages, you can have prices. Uh, it's, a, it's a convenient way of uh, expressing menus, expressing, uh, you know, if you, you have a shop you want to, you want to tell you want to be able to tell uh, to people what what you're going to get in exchange for uh, for these goods, but it's also enable economic calculation, right? If you say, well, it's going to cost me this much to do this and that much to do this, you can compare these numbers, and so having just a single scale on which you can compare things makes things easier. So those are traditionally the three roles of money. Uh, why do we need money? And that's a uh, that's a, question, that's a good question. Well, typically it's because we want to maximize optionality. So let's say I have a bunch of fish. Ah, oh, this works, I have a bunch of fish. And I don't know what I want. I have fish today. In the future, maybe I will want to buy a house for my fish or a steak or a banana in this case. So I, I don't know what I want. And uh, I, 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 I don't know what I will want in the future, but if I just keep my fish, my fish is just gonna rot and it will not be good. And so the trick is I will exchange my fish for money and then I will be exchange, able to exchange my fish for a house, my money for a house or for a steak or for a banana. Now you might say, why not just exchange my fish for a house and then I can always exchange a house for a steak or for a banana at a later point if I change my mind. And the idea is you want to get the good which is going to be easiest to buy all this other stuff with. Right, and one of them is going to be money, and mo money is the obvious choice because it will be easier to buy your house with money than with stack. It will be easier to buy your stack uh, with money. So you can think of it as uh, routing uh, in a graph of barter. So a little bit of history. I'm not going to go into uh, the dates. I mostly just want to show the evolution of the concept of money. So first you have barter, and barter works if you have a complete graph. So I have fish, and I can trade it for bananas, or for steak, or for houses. So you can exchange everything for anything. And the problem with that is you need a coincidence of needs or wants. So if I have fish, and I want steak, and the person who has steak doesn't actually want fish, maybe what they want is a house, then I can't get my steak we need to go and find a third person who has a house and do like a triangular trade. It's complicated to uh, route around this graph because not all the edges are present. And so the solution to that problem, as I was saying, is you introduce commodity money. So for example, seashells. 
And seashells, you know, maybe you start with pretty seashells, they don't really have a whole lot of value by themselves, but they become a convention. You say, I'll exchange my fish for seashell, and then I'll exchange my seashell for steak. So what you lose is that now you have to do at least two hops in your graph instead of one hop. You will have to just take a hop through the hub. But the benefit is that everyone goes through the hub, so you no longer have a problem of coincidence of needs and wants, because anyone who has steaks and doesn't want it is going to want seashells. Anyone who has fish and doesn't want it is going to want seashells. So you can, um, you can route your trade in a very, very efficient way. And it's really hard to come up with a graph that's more optimal than this for making, uh, for making trade. So that's the origin of commodity money. I put a seashell here because I made these slides with emojis, and there's no emoji for gold, but also, you know, obviously, historically, gold has been a, uh, an important uh, uh, source of commodity money uh, well until the uh, 1970s, in fact. So then you have banking and credits. So the idea of banking and credits is to reduce the need for money. So let's say, for example, you have steak and I have fish, and we don't really have money right now, but we have prices, right? There's already money in the system, so we have some idea of how much your fish is worth and how much my steak is worth. So instead of that, I'll say, I'll pay, you know, I'll, I'll pay you in the future, and then maybe we do another trade, and then the credit just washes off. So it's a way of making trade without needing money. But the trick is that for it to work, you need to have money. So you can expand, in some sense, the money supply by using credits. The benefit is that so you reduce the need for money, it's faster. Uh, you don't need to actually exchange the money. It's safer because so, no one can come in and, uh, and take the money. You know, the credit is in your name. And it facilitates long distance trade, right? If you want to go, uh, you're in Europe and you want to go buy uh, spices in India, well, you can have your boats and you fill it with bullion. And now you have to deal with pirates or you have to deal with, if you go buy land with, uh, uh, with, uh, with robbers. Whereas if you have something like a banking system where you will say, OK, I will put my money in a bank. You will put your money in a bank. And the banks will have credit relationship with one another. You can send money at very long distances without actually having to move the money. So that's very, that's very safe. That's a big benefit. Um, there are problems with it, which is that so your, your credit system could be based on reputation. So I have a reputation of being a good creditor. I pay back my debts. That's great, but that doesn't really scale. How does it work if you, you know, it works in a small village. In a very large economy, if someone doesn't have any reputation and they don't have access to credits, then that can be, uh, that, that, that can be a problem for them. They can't prove that um, they would be good, uh, good creditors. If you end up only lending money to people that you've lent money before, it's kind of uh, circular and can leave people out of the economic system. Uh, the other one is that another way of enforcing credit is uh, by force. So if you don't pay your debts, you know, your, uh, uh, maybe you go to prison or maybe your, uh, your, your assets are seized or something like that. But this, uh, this type of enforcement is going to favor very large power structure, uh, like very large uh, nations and governments who can actually enforce uh, those rules. Those are some of the downsides of, uh, of banking and credits. So fiat money, so that's both old and new. Uh, you had fiat money in, uh, in China in uh, 1080. So it's basically paper money. So it's not based on commodity. It's based on the realization that really what we're doing with this money, we're just keeping track. You know, I'm keeping track of how many fish I gave. I'm keeping track of how many uh, stakes I got. Uh, and if you're just going to keep track of something, there's no reason that your money itself needs to be worth anything. So it's like, you know, it's like seashells. And the world has been running on uh, fiat money since basically 1971, when the U.S. severed the link between uh, gold and, uh, and the U.S. dollar. So why is it that fiat is valuable? And you've had different explanations. One is uh, legal tender laws. So the, you know, the government goes and say, you have to accept this uh, as money. But on the other hand, they don't prevent you from accepting something else. Uh, taxation, so that's a, oops, that's a theory of chartalism. So the idea is that I want to own fiat money because at the end of the year, I need to pay my taxes. I need to pay my taxes in money, so I will have to hold some. So that's one of the reasons. But really, the main reason, I think, is that it's common knowledge that it's money. Just because if everyone knows that it's money, if we're all routing all our trades through this graph, just because we all know that and that the structure, that makes it work. And a really nice uh, historical experiment is one of the um, Iraqi Swiss dinar. So Saddam Hussein 
uh, they used to have their, uh, their dinar prints by a company in Switzerland, and they would have these beautiful uh, Iraqi dinars. Uh, and at some point, the, uh, Switzerland decided to stop printing uh, those, uh, those dinars because it, it, you know, even though it was Switzerland, it's, you know, they, they, they were reluctant at some point to, 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 to keep being associated with Saddam Hussein. Uh, and so they printed uh, other ones with paper from China and it was a crappier quality. Uh, and so they had these two bills in circulation, but it was the same money. And then at some point, Saddam Hussein had a great idea because most, uh, most of these Swiss dinars, they were actually in the hand of bankers in Jordan, which he did not like, which he did not like. And so he said, okay, we're gonna remove the old bills from circulation. They will only be the new bills. However, you, so you will go to the bank and you can exchange your old bills for the new bills. And you will have one week to do it. And during that one week, I'm gonna close the border. <laughs> so he ended up just like closing it and then the old ones were not accepted. However, in Kurdistan, people were still using the Swiss dinar and they were still trading. And in fact, because the Iraqi central bank was inflating a lot of the new ones and these ones, no one was printing them anymore. They started becoming more valuable. So you had a fiat currency issued by your government that no government recognized, but people were still using them because they worked for them. And so when, you know, I'll talk about when Bitcoin came around the corner, a lot of people said, well, how can this thing have any value? You know, why would it have any value? It's not gold, it's not by, by government. You know, if, if, if enough people believe it has value and they start uh, forming common knowledge that it has value, this thing can, this thing can build value. Okay, so electronic money. So now that you have fiat money, that, does, that really represents just in some sense a, uh, uh, some, some sort of balance, you can, you can put that on some electronic ledger. Most money today is electronic money. You know, we, it's not, not Bitcoin, just like the regular money you have in your bank accounts is electronic money. Uh, this is a graph from uh, the Federal Reserve. So what you have in purple here is a currency in circulation. So that's the actual coins, the actual bills, like physical cash. Um, and the, uh, the monetary base uh, in, uh, that you have here in, uh, in blue is, includes also all the, all the bank accounts. So you can see here around 2008, it started like, creating a lot of money in the banking system, not necessarily in a, not necessarily in a, in a coinage. And then you have the M2, which also dwarfs that, which includes other things such as uh, short-term bonds, money market deposits, this type of stuff. Okay, so all of this money is essentially uh, electronics, the vast majority of it. All right, eCash. So the idea of eCash, which started becoming uh, popular in the 90s, late 90s, is we would like to have electronic money, but that's not banking money, like something closer to cash, uh, with these properties that you don't have to trust a third party, so it's not based on credits. I have it, I give it to you, now you have it. Just like, uh, just like cash, but electronically. So not based on credits, uh, and also potentially private. You know, uh, in a cash transaction, I make a cash transaction with you that just involves the two of us, whereas if I, uh, if I do it through the banking system, then it, it involves a whole lot of, um, a whole slew of actors. Okay, so cryptocurrencies, um, are going to be uh, with the first realization of eCash. I'm going to speak a little bit to um, their design and some of the problems that they faced initially. Motivation. Sorry, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit here. So motivation for cryptocurrencies, protection against debasements. So there's a lot of countries where the population was ruined by hyperinflation. Not a lot, but a, f uh, a few. There's, of course, Famous example of Germany uh, after World War I. Uh, I think this is uh, Somaliland. And recently the government of Somaliland has, a, so there's been a lot of inflation, also a lot of counterfeits. The government of Somaliland recently introduced a new uh, currency and they're accepting all deposits, including the fake ones. You can bring your fake one to the, and, and the trick is because it's worth less than the paper it's printed on. So you cannot make money by printing more fake ones and, 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 and bringing it to them. So, you know, being, being protected against that is, is certainly valuable. It seems to be less of a problem now in, in developed countries which have uh, developed independent central banks and, and more protections against that. Uh, censorship resistance. So today, if you use your money, you need to have someone's permission uh, to use your money. Uh, 
and that can be uh, that can be potentially uh, problematic if you're a political dissident, for example. You might not uh, you might want to uh, be want to be able to use your money without uh, without asking permission from your from your government in the first place. Disintermediation. So right now again, to use your money, you need to have someone there. That person may be uh, charging you uh, money for doing it. They may be disagreeing with how you're spending the money. They may be uh, uh, spying on you. And convenience. You know, there's something beautiful about cryptocurrencies today is that uh, it crosses borders. Really, you cannot, you know, you, you can use uh, Bitcoin pretty much anywhere in, uh, uh, in the world, even if it's uh, not uh, very popular, at least it, it you know, I, if, I, if, I, if I get money from Cambodia, I can probably only use it in Cambodia. If I get uh, Bitcoin, I will find a few people, but they will be everywhere around the world that can use it. It's programmable. You can program your money. You can do things with it without having uh, access to an API and having people uh, force you to uh, register for a key or even cut you out of their API. And it's predictable. You know, the nice thing is that you know what the rules are from the get-go and you know exactly, you know, you, you, you can tell a little bit what will, uh, what will happen when you, when you program it. So that's uh, some of the benefits. A big one is privacy uh, with, uh, with one caveat. So why would you have privacy? Uh, protect political dissidents, protect against discrimination. So, you know, imagine that uh, a typical example was that there was this, um, this, there was this story about a father on, uh, who learned on Facebook that his daughter was pregnant because of the ads that he was being showed based on his IP. And you learn a lot of things from this type of stuff that you buy in a store. And right now you're giving all of this data to your bank because your transactions are not, uh, are not private. And so you can potentially be discriminated about, uh, against based on your uh, purchases. And also protect individual expression. Um, there's a lot of things that we do in public life and that we do in private lives that are different. You know, there's things that I might say to a close circle of friends that I not necessarily would broadcast to the entire world. And you can be more genuine and more authentic when you are allowed to have uh, private thoughts. And if you're not allowed to have any private uh, transaction and economic activity, then that, I think that curtails economic uh, uh, individual expression. You know, if you imagine that everything you buy when you go to a supermarket is going to be broadcasted to the entire world, uh, you might, you know, you, 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 you might feel different. You might say, well, you know, I, I feel bad about getting another uh, dozen donuts. Uh, if you look at China now, has, is starting to have like a credit score system for its citizens and uh, that gives you access to credit, gives you access to different benefits. And it's based on stuff like this. You know, you overeat, you, like, you buy too much things, you buy alcohol, for example, in the supermarket, and your credit goes down. So privacy is important. With a big caveat that the most popular systems today, like Bitcoin, are not private. They're actually very, very public. Uh, as we'll see, privacy is very difficult to achieve, but it is achievable in those systems. Okay, design. How do we build these things? Okay, so the first building block is uh, digital signatures. So digital signatures are a piece of cryptography introduced in the 17th and uh, 18th, uh, and it basically provides these three properties. Uh, authentication, so I have a message, I produce a signature for that message as a string of bits, and, that's, uh, and that authentifies me. You know, I'm the only one who could have been making that signature, it's me. Integrity, it means the message was not modified. So you know, not only am I the only one who could have signed this, but also I signed this message and not any other message. And non-repudiation, which means I can't, I can't go out at a later point and say, oh, actually, I didn't sign it. So, you know, it's a proof to everyone else that I, that I signed it. I can't go out and, and say I didn't. And that's a really, really big building block that came after um, encryption. And the idea is that you can authorize transactions with digital signatures. And I, it's, it's not based on your identity anymore. You can have a piece of information that proves that you wanted to do something because you hold a certain secret. So that's a very, very powerful primitive. And when you have digital signatures, you might think, OK, that's all we need. We can, uh, we can do eCash. And not so fast. So the problem you have immediately if you try to design an eCash system with a signature is you're going to run into the double spend problem. So you have Mallory here. And uh, she's going to sign a check to Alice. And so she sends her signature and says, OK, you know what? I'm sending you, I'm sending you some cash. Here's a signature. But immediately, she also does the same thing to Bob. 
And the problem is that how does Bob know that the check is provisioned? You know, even if we had a system where we knew that Mallory has a certain amount of money, like if she sends it both at the same time to Alice and Bob, they don't really have a good way of, uh, of, of, of knowing who really got the money. And the problem is that we're in a realm of mathematics and equational uh, reasoning. And in this, in this realm, there's no scarcity, right? I have a value X. I can have as many value X's as I want. It's just information. Information can be duplicated uh, infinitely. And here, we're trying to do something which has scarcity. We want to represent only, uh, a, 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 you know, Mallory has a finite amount of money, not an infinite amount of money. And so equational reasoning gets hard with this type of, uh, of problems. So one solution is timestamping. So you could use a timestamping service. Um, and so the way it works is so Alice signs a check to Bob, and then she sends it to a timestamper service, and the timestamper is trusted. And he says, OK, I see that you signed a check to Bob, and here's a signature attesting that you made that check at this time. And so now if we have a single timestamping service, we'll have a way of knowing which check came first, the one to Alice, you know, the one to Alice or the one to Bob. But the problem is Bob still doesn't know if they are in previous signatures. So I get a check and I say, OK, this check is dated from now. How do I know that there doesn't exist a check signed previously uh, from that person? And so the last piece we need is uh, we need publication. Essentially, the way we're going to know that there were no transactions before that is that we're going to publish all transactions publicly. And if all the transactions are visible publicly, then I can look through all the transactions, see that you never made a, this transaction, and, and accept it. So they call it a uh, bulletin board in uh, cryptography papers. And it, because it works exactly like a bulletin board. Imagine a website that everyone can access, where everyone can put information, and when you can just go and read the information uh, in a, a chronological order. So you're going to publish all the transactions to the built-in board. And by the way, this is why privacy is going to be difficult with the systems, precisely because you need to know if a transaction has been made before. So all the transactions are broadcasted publicly. They're going to be ordered. They're going to be known. And so uh, an optimization you can make on this built-in board is also you could reject invalid transactions. And now the system works if you allow invalid transactions. You could put all the transactions, valid, invalid, and then say, well, you know, it's your job to look at the built-in board and only care about the ones which are valid. But you can have the built-in board reject invalid transactions. That way you look at it and you know that it's all, uh, it's all valid. So that's essentially how you do, um, how you do e -cash. The problem is how do you actually create this built-in board? That's, you know, that sounds difficult. And uh, well, one way you could do it is by having a centralized mint. So you'll have a centralized company that mints the currency and that runs this website. The problem with that, obviously, is that you put a lot of trust in that mint. Well, they, could, they could reorder transactions. They could delete transactions. They could refuse transactions. They could go out of business. So that's, a, that's difficult. You could use distributed consensus. So you could use state machine replication, uh, have many mints, so many different actors uh, who together maintain a coherent log. But already, you know, that requires uh, some tricky algorithms in distributed consensus to do this. It's not a trivial problem. But is there a decentralized solution where we're not relying on one mint or even a finite set of mints, but where anyone uh, could really participate in the system? And so Bitcoin was the first uh, protocol to propose a decentralized solution to this problem. And uh, here's how it does it. So it came out in 2008. Uh, so it's been 10 years now that, uh, well, the paper came out in 2008. Uh, Bitcoin launched in early 2009. So it's going to be 10 years soon. It was the first successful cryptocurrency. There were attempts uh, before that didn't really, uh, didn't really work. And so in terms of design, um, so it uses proof of work. What is proof of work? Proof of work is a concept based on a partial hash collision. So a hash collision is when you take two different messages, you put them through a cryptographic hash function, and they give you the same hash. Now, if your cryptographic hash function is well designed, you're not going to be able to do this. It would be computationally infeasible to find a collision. Uh, however, you can ask for a partial hash collision. You could say, I would like two hashes to match in their first uh, 10 bits, for example, or, or, or 15 bits. Or I would, uh, you know, if, if the hash 
of a message is a 256-bit number, I would like it to be below a certain value. And that way you can tune it and you can uh, tune the efforts that someone would need in order to uh, produce such a hash. And that was introduced by cryptographer Adam Beck in 1997 for email spam. So one proposed solution for email spam is to say, you know, if everyone had to spend a dollar or you know, even a few cents to send an email, it's really bad for spam. Because the way that spammers work is they send millions and millions of email, and then maybe one out of 10,000 will open the email and then will we'll buy the product. If it costs just one cent or a few cents to send an email, most people will not mind, but, but it will be very, very expensive for spammers to do that. Now, the problem is you could, tr you, you could try to tie email to the entire like, payment system and banking system, but that's very, um, that's very difficult to do. Like I said, it's a centralized system. It does, it's not very programmable. Uh, it's fragmented. Uh, it's very, you know, bank, bank, banking systems are different around the world. So you can't really do this with an open protocol like email. However, what you could do is you could say, you'll find a hash collision. It will cost you CPU, it will cost you time, it will cost you money. And we can force you these costs. Now, it's expensive because it's not a transfer. You know, this money is not going to pay for anything. It's just going to be destroyed. But in some sense, it's a small amount of money it can protect against spam. And uh, for some reason, Hashcash didn't really um, take off their fields in SMTP to accept it, but it was not widely implemented by, uh, by clients, unfortunately. And what it does that's really interesting is that it creates a tie between real-world resources, like computing power, electricity, and information. <laughs> I was talking about how information uh, is not scarce. You can always duplicate information, but this is scarce. This is something that you can verify mathematically, which is scarce. So that, that, that's interesting, and that's the first piece of building something like Bitcoin. So the second piece was the Nakamoto consensus uh, introduced in the Bitcoin paper. And so the way this works is that miners are going to, so they're actors in the Bitcoin ecosystem, they produce blocks. What is a block? A block is a timestamp, so that's a time at which a miner claims a block was created. You have a commitment to a Merkle tree of transactions. So essentially, you take a lot of transactions, you put them into a hash tree structure, which is a cryptographic structure that commits you to the set of all transactions. You put the previous block hash. So a block is going to point to a previous block. And then you put a proof of work nonce. And the idea is that if you hash this entire header, it should be below a certain difficulty threshold. So you, you're going to fiddle with the nonce until your header passes a proof of work problem. And the idea is that you start with just an, one empty block, and then after that, people are going to compete. They're going to try to solve these proof of work systems and produce more blocks. So I find a block, I add it, you know, I add it to the previous block. And, the mi and, and so you have an entire ecosystem of miners who are going to expand this computing power and try to extend a chain of blocks and make it as long as possible. And if you do that, you actually have a consensus algorithm. But what's different is that whereas uh, classical consensus algorithm uh, are based on a principle that you have a set of n people, and then these n people need to agree, there's no set of people. The set of people is anyone with computing power. So anyone who has computing power can join into this, uh, this algorithm. And then there's some drawbacks to that, which is also to, to say that, hey, you know, if someone has computing power or more computing power than anyone else, and then maybe they can have a disproportionate influence uh, in, the, uh, in the outcome. And the other idea of, uh, of Bitcoin is that the, all these blocks and transactions, they're propagated on a gossip network in the same, uh, in the same um, actually there's not a whole lot of, uh, of gossip network uh, uh, that, I can, uh, that I can think about, but the idea is that you propagate your messages to peers and your peer propagates them to, uh, to other peers. So it was based on the idea of using these peer-to-peer -peer networks um, uh, like uh, Gnutella, for example, that were used for file sharing, but trying to have a peer-to-peer -peer network for maintaining uh, a ledger. So that was a breakthrough, uh, and it has a few challenges. There are a few challenges uh, with it. So one is uh, you still have something called a 51% attack. So if I control more than 51% of the uh, computing power or hashing power in this network, then even though you, you know, everyone who's honest is creating their chain, and I go out and I create my chain in my own corner, and my chain gets longer than the other one because I'm producing it at 51% the speed, and they're producing it at 49% the speed, so I go faster, and I keep my chain to myself, 
and then I reveal it, and then everything changes. So I can really, uh, you can really harm the system if you have 51% of the uh, other system. The other uh, issue is throughput. So Bitcoin produces uh, one megabyte. They uh, raised the size recently, but the, the producer is one megabyte size blocks every 10 minutes uh, because it's based on um, a real network like the internet. You need to uh, account for potentially long latencies uh, and, and, and small bandwidth. And as a result, you can only achieve something like four transactions per second uh, on Bitcoin, whereas networks like Visa are doing thousands and thousands of transactions per, per second. The other one is cost uh, energy and energy expenditures. This is something that's really, really energy intensive. Um, you know, it started with CPUs. Today, people are using uh, custom chips for doing, this, so for doing this. And one of the major expense in producing these blocks is energy. And you have a bit of a red queen race between people because as more people put in more computing power, the difficulty of the proof of work challenges increases. And so today, I think, uh, you have a few billion uh, dollars of electricity spent every year just to secure the, uh, the Bitcoin network. Now, you have one argument, which is to say, hey, you know what, it's worth it. You know, it's worth spending that money, but you're, um, the, it, it raises the question of knowing if there's a way to, uh, to do it more cheaply and without spending as much energy. There are other issues like uh, selfish, uh, selfish mining, which don't completely threaten uh, Bitcoin, but which uh, can cause some issues where some miners uh, who have a large stake in the network without having 51% uh, become more efficient uh, than others. Uh, you have issues of synchronicity. So even though uh, Bitcoin looks different than uh, traditional uh, consensus algorithm, it is actually more more, somewhat more restricted in its uh, assumptions. In the sense that if, so, you know, this 51% attack, that works if everyone gets the blocks right away. If you can start delaying blocks in the network by 10 minutes, then it becomes a 33% attack. And if you can start delaying blocks by uh, hours, then it becomes something like more like a 10% attack or a 5% attack. So the, um, the safety of the, of the system gets markedly worse if you can uh, harm uh, the network and the ability for blocks to be uh, transited. But that's tied also to throughput. You know, this is why you can't have a Bitcoin block every second uh, is because essentially of the synchronicity problem. And another one, which is more general, is protocol level innovation. So the Bitcoin protocol is a little set in stone. Uh, there's been a ton of research uh, on the field of cryptocurrency since Bitcoin, and it's hard uh, for Bitcoin to come to agreement or consensus over changes to its own protocol. So now I'm going to talk a little more about blockchains in general, take uh, uh, a step back from um, this Bitcoin uh, design, and explain how blockchains work. Uh, and where Tezos fits in. So stateful, statefulness in a stateless world. Uh, so the general I, so, sorry. The general idea for statefulness in a stateless world is that, you know, I was explaining earlier that information can just be replicated. It's because all these equational systems are really, um, they really, they, they, they don't carry any state. It's kind of like anything that you do in cryptography is kind of like doing functional programming uh, in the sense that you don't really have states. You don't have mutation. You just have things and then you could just, you could just copy them. Uh, everything's immutable uh, and, and, and you can't change things. You can't say like, I had money and now I don't have it anymore. And we would like to have um, this type of statefulness, but in the realm of cryptography where normally we don't really have it. So what is a blockchain? So it's a concurrent data structure. It's a data structure that many people can access uh, at the same time. And it represents a shared, mutable singleton. So singleton because you only want one value of it. You don't want to have many, many, many possible blockchain at one time. You want to know which one is the right one. Um, you want this value to be mutable. You want to be able to change uh, the set of your ledger and the set of balances. And you want it to be shared. And the way you're going to represent that is as a linked list of blocks of operations. So like I said, like in Bitcoin, you're going to have a block, and the block is going to point towards a previous block. So motivation. So why do we do it like this? Because it's an append-only data structure. So it's an immutable data structure. Uh, what data structures are immutable? Simple values, simply linked list, trees. All of these are immutable data structure because you just keep adding to them. So you're not really changing the structure. You're creating a new structure that points to the old structure. 
You know, that's what you do in OCaml all the time. Uh, some structures are typically not append only, like uh, doubly linked lists, for example. Uh, union find, union find is just like it's a one example that shows that uh, there's some stuff that can be done in uh, imperative programming that has a log n penalty in functional programming. at C union find structure or grass. Uh, so how do we get mutability through immutable data structures? Uh, there's a simple trick. So let's say we had the word your and we want to make a correction and call it your. Well, what we'll do is that we'll just point to it and say, okay, this is the old version, this is the new version. Voila, I've mutated it by just adding to it. Uh, and the problem is that as soon as you have concurrency, you have a problem because I edited it, but then you edited it, and then that person edited it. And so now we have two, uh, we have two different versions, and that's the problem. If you have a simply linked list, in reality you have a tree, right? And the question is, which leaf I'm going to take in that tree? Uh, so um, introducing the blockchains uh, as essentially uh, state monads. So uh, the trick is that we're going, to take, uh, we're going to take a mutable state and we're going to uh, represent it through a series, as a series of operations. So for Bitcoin, your state is a set of unspent outputs. It's every balance that belongs to anyone that hasn't been spent. Plus, the total amount of work that's been done in a chain, we'll see why that matters, and the block number. And the operations that you have are going to be transactions. Okay, so generally speaking, uh, in your blockchain, you're going to have a, a function called apply, which takes a state, takes an operation, and returns to you a new state. And we're just going to put all these operations into blocked, into our linked list. Sounds great. Uh, and like I said, so in general, it can be a tree, so how do you pick a canonical leaf? So what you need is a well ordering over the branches. Uh, we ask for something a little stronger than that because it's easier to work with. Uh, we're going to ask a score function that takes a state and gives us a value of the state. So that way I have a state here, I have a state here, I have a state here. I'm just going to pick whatever state has the highest score and call that my canonical state. So essentially every blockchain implementation that you see can be subsumed by a pair, apply, and score. That's really uh, every blockchain is, uh, is built like this. And so how do you implement score? Uh, you have several options. So in Bitcoin, it's the total difficulty of the branch. It's the total hashing power for all the puzzles that have been solved in history. And so that's why, uh, that's why I put the total work in the states because I need, to, I need to look at that and uh, I need to keep track of that to pick my, to create my score function. Uh, you could be centralized. You could have a central party say, that's the right branch. You know, they will sign the branch and say, that's the one. Or you could have something like proof of stake where you validate your counts, the number of signature that you can have in a certain branch or the length of the branch. So different methods of uh, implementing score. So in general, you can, uh, you can take a blockchain protocol and decompose it into three layers. Uh, one is going to be the network layer, which is how do you communicate with the rest of the world? How do you exchange operations? How do you exchange blocks? It's this famous uh, gossip network. But it doesn't have to be a gossip network. You could have direct lines. You could have many different uh, network architecture in order to, uh, uh, to communicate. You have the consensus layer, which is to say, okay, now we're getting all these messages. How do we agree on one consistent state? So that's the mechanism by which you're going to um, look at all of this information that comes on the network and decide what your state is. And a transaction layer, which is, okay, which we sometimes call the economic protocol, uh, what do operations do? Like, what is the meaning of operations? And the way you get decentralization is by entangling two and three, essentially. You're going to say, I'm going to use some stuff in my transaction layer to get consensus. So the way this works in Bitcoin is that, and I didn't mention, when you create a block, you get rewarded by newly created Bitcoins so that you can transact at a later point. So you get some economic incentive for going to consensus. And that's the general idea of this, um, of this blockchain protocol, is creating economic incentives for people to behave honestly and inside the protocol. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about governance and self amendments which is a, uh, a property of, uh, of Tezos. So first, fork-based governance, which is what is most common outside of, uh, outside of Tezos. So fork-based governance comes from the open source world. So in, traditionally in the open source world, when you have a project and you have a different view as to how the project should work, you fork it. So 
you had one version of the code, now you have two versions of the code, and you can have two different teams go in different directions. Uh, so for example, you know, um, forks sometimes happen for licensing reasons, uh, x386 and xorg, for the, uh, who remembers that fork, or OpenOffice and, uh, and LibreOffice. But sometimes they just go because people have different uh, IDs on where they want to take projects. And the nice thing is that as a user, I can choose. I can go with one version, and then a few months after, if I decide that the other people were right, I can switch to the other version. So this is great because everyone gets uh, what they want. There's no scarcity. It's wonderful. But if you try to do that with cryptocurrencies, it gets a little trickier. So how does a fork work in a cryptocurrency? So let's say I had a Bitcoin, and now there's two different versions of the code base that run. Well, I'm going to end up having a Bitcoin in each of these versions. I'm going to have a Bitcoin version A and Bitcoin version B if there's two versions of the code. So at first, that's great. I have a choice. But do I keep both? Do I actually sell one of them to get the other one? Do I, and because if I have two, it's inconvenience. You know, like I said, I want to maximize optionality. I want to have the one that people are going to use. So I, I kind of have to make a decision. And then a few months later, if I made the wrong choice, then maybe one of them dropped in value. And so now, you know, I've lost money and that's very inconvenient. It's not the same as changing your, uh, your window manager. And so that's a, that's a limitation of four big governance. One of the, one of the version in the fork is going to capture the value. And the question is, uh, which one? So before I get to that, there's two kind of forks, broadly speaking, that people talk about when they talk about cryptocurrencies. One is a hard fork. Uh, and in a hard fork, participants agree to change the rules of the protocol. We had a protocol, and we're going to have different rules. And the test for it is that blocks which in the past were invalid are now valid. Right? So I have a different structure in my blocks. You know, the, the old algorithm would look at this and say, that block is not valid, but now we decide it's valid. In a soft fork, you only restrict the set of valid blocks. You change the code in a way that blocks that you would have accepted in the past, you now reject. And the nice thing about it is that if you're using an old client, you're not going to be, um, you, don't need, you don't need to up, up, update your own client. The only people that need to update are the people who produce blocks to make sure that they don't produce blocks which are now invalid. And there's this idea that a soft fork is somehow softer you know, than a hard fork because you're not forcing anything on anyone. You're not telling people, like, you need to accept invalid blocks. You need to upgrade your software. Oh, no, no, you don't need to do anything. You know, we're just, we're just going to narrow down the rules. Uh, in practice, however, with a soft fork, you can do almost anything that you would do with a hard fork, almost anything you want. For example, here's an example of a soft fork. You could say, well, uh, person number A can spend their, you know, they used to be able to spend their tokens. Now we will only accept blocks where Alice sends all of her tokens to Bob. You could have a block like this. And so, you know, you just restricted the, the, the set of what was possible, but essentially you've taken Alice's token and given them to Bob. That's what happened. And so, yeah, every hard fork you can almost implement as a soft fork at the cost of a little bit of complication. So which forks win? You know, when, once, you, once you have a fork, you have two branches, which one is going to win? So one popular theory with, with Bitcoin was that it was going to be the one with the most hashing power. You know, the miners, they solve these problems, and they're going to choose one branch that's the one they're going to care about, and that's the winning one. The problem is like, OK, but which branch do miners choose to put hashing power behind? Is it the one that users adopt? So if everyone prefers and values more one branch, then the miners would be crazy to spend a lot of resources on the other branch. They're going to want to go on the one that the users adopt. So maybe the users are in charge. Is this going to be the best one? You know, I once read that uh, Bitcoin didn't need governance because in Bitcoin we just take the best technological solution available and that's it. Uh, and of course, that doesn't tell like who d who decides which one is the best one. That's a uh, that's a problem. You're just like pushing the buck. Uh, and I, I argue that the fork that win is the one that is expected to win. Because of this money aspect, which is very circular, people are going to think, OK, what do people think the winner is going to be? And this is the one they're going to value. And so I should value the winner. It doesn't really matter if one is technology better than the other. Really, what matters is what people are going to adopt. And that's completely circular. Everyone, in fact, could be thinking the same thing. Everyone could be thinking, like, well, this version is worse than the other, but I'm going to pick this one because it's the most natural one and everyone's going to agree to that. Um, so, you know, why does it matter that we agree? Why should we 
uh, get along. Why not fork? Why not have many, many versions and everyone who disagrees gets its own, uh, own fork? You know, competition is good. Uh, we'll have the, you know, the best chain will win. We'll get a blockchain for everyone. And the problem is that the economics favor one chain. Um, it's just more economical to have uh, one token on one chain. And so what you'll have in doing so is uh, you'll have costly destruction at first, where you'll have a lot of, you know, you'll have potentially forking. And if something uh, takes over the other one, you'll have uh, value will be lost. And the other one is potentially stagnation. At some point, you get to the point where you can't really credibly fork. If you fork off the main branch that everyone is really tied to, then your fork has very low chance of succeeding. And therefore, you have a very low chance of actually uh, being able to innovate. Um, in game theory, uh, one example of that uh, fork dynamic is called the battle of the sexes. So um, in this game, you have a, a wife and a husband. And, uh, and here, the, um, the husband would rather go to the theater and the wife uh, would rather go to the baseball match. So if they, if, if they both go to the theater, the husband gets three points and the wife gets, gets two points. Um, if they both go to the baseball match, it's a baseball game, um, the wife gets two points and the husband gets three points. But they really care about being with each other, right? So you know, if they go to different places, they're not going to be happy. And the weird thing with this game is that you have these two equilibrium, and each of them is going to try to convince the other one that, you know what, I'll go to the baseball game no matter what, I don't care. And it's very similar to the game of chicken, where you have two cars running at each other and saying, hey, um, you know, I'm not going to steer. Uh, you know, um, I tied my hand, I'm not even going to steer. So you have to steer, or we're going to crash into each other. And you have the same dynamic when you see forks in cryptocurrencies, where some, you know, no one really wants to fork. Everyone wants to steer the direction of the main branch. And they'll say, like, well, if you don't let me steer, I'm going to fork. And, and, and now we'll be divided, now we'll be bad for everyone. So it's not a really good way to have, um, it's not a really good way to have governance. So again, on the, uh, on, on the branch that wins, um, one way of describing the branch that wins is the one that becomes a shelling point. So that's a, uh, it's a concept from, uh, from Thomas Schelling, uh, also called sometimes a focal point. And uh, the, yeah, the general idea is that uh, it's not the algorithm that controls the decentralized ledger, it's not the miners, it's not necessarily the developers or the stakeholders, it's a social consensus. It's basically what everyone agrees is, uh, is a ledger. So to give you an idea of a, um, of a shelling point, you need to meet someone in Paris, you both know the day, uh, but you didn't set a time and place. Right, so where do you meet? And usually I have a pause here, so it's more dramatic. Uh, but the usual answer I get, it, it works almost every time, is you meet under the Eiffel Tower at noon. You know, that's where you meet if you didn't set any details, because it's the obvious choice. Because you know, Paris, the Eiffel Tower, it's kind of central, you'll find the person. Uh, without coordination, it's what people would come up with. Train stations are also an acceptable answer in, uh, in most cities. So that's the shelling point. That's, uh, you know, without coordination, you kind of agree on what's the natural one. And that's, and that's pretty much what dictates the result of, uh, of forks in, uh, in cryptocurrencies. So, we try to do something different in, uh, in Tezos, and uh, we do that through the power of self-amendment. So the idea is that instead of changing by forking into a different version, we're going to try to change from the inside. So what I mean by changing from the inside is we're going to have changes to the code, but they're going to come from the blockchain itself. So how do we do that? Well, you remember the apply function and the fitness function? Well, you know, we can treat those functions at a value and put them inside the state that we modify. So now the state of our blockchain, instead of just containing uh, the state of, uh, of balances uh, or the total amount of work, it's also going to contain the function itself. And we'll have a new type of operation called an amendment, which can modify those. So now I can not just make transactions, I can also submit operations which modify the rules of the ledger. And in order to do interesting things, we're also going to let these amendments introspect into protocols. So the idea is that I can make changes to apply, but for my operation to be valid, I can require to have some structure on apply. I can say, I don't want to re replace my apply function with just any function. The apply function that you give me has to have certain properties. So why, do we, why would we uh, do self-amendments? 
uh, because it gives us explicit governance. Now we have a very specific operation with very specific rules, like voting, for example, which would let us uh, change the protocol. And that's kind of like having the rule of law. Um, there's been a lot of contentious debates uh, in Bitcoin around the block size or around the Ethereum hard forks. And the problem with this contentious debate is that if you don't have a, a, a hard rule to go by with, then it, it's kind of, um, they kind of carry on forever. Uh, reward innovation, uh, right now, today, if, if you have some cool idea in the blockchain space, uh, you, everyone's tended to start their own blockchain because there's not a whole lot of reward for contributing to an, uh, an, uh, an existing one, but we can create an environment where if someone comes up with a new breakthrough, they can uh, submit it, to, sub submit it to, uh, to the Tezos protocol and then issue uh, tokens to themselves as, um, uh, as reward for, ha for having done so. You can solve collective action problems. So uh, having a block reward in Bitcoin solves the collective action problem of getting security in the system. But there's others like evangelizing, telling people about, about it, or maintaining and building infrastructure that's needed for the network. Um, you know, let's say you want to build uh, a mesh radio network for uh, transmitting your blocks. That's, you know, that's something you can, um, you can solve. And, um, in general, you're creating coordination technology. It's not just money. Money is a tool of coordination, but blockchain is also a tool of coordination. Um, what you do with this thing is, I, I, I talk about this uh, super Nash equilibria. So in economics, you have uh, the Pareto uh, optimality. So the idea of Pareto optimality is that we have a solution to a problem, and I cannot make a better solution without making anyone worse off. So that's, you know, that's, that's something that's pretty fair. I can't really improve it without hurting someone. And Nash equilibrium is uh, no one benefits from deviating from that strategy. And the problem is that Nash equilibrium are not Pareto optimal, right? So the most famous example is the prisoner's dilemma, where the prisoners, uh, they would both benefit from working with each other. So that's Pareto optimal. In general, cooperation is Pareto optimal. But their individual interest is to defect. So defection is a Nash equilibrium. And one cool theorem is that if you let people uh, inside this, uh, these games, uh, make contracts with each other, transact with each other, come up to agreement, then you obtain uh, what is called a super Nash equilibrium, which is a Nash equilibrium that's stable against all contracts and coalitions. And every super Nash equilibrium is part of optimal. So the idea is that if you give people the tools to, uh, to coordinate, then uh, they're going to favor uh, cooperation over uh, defection. So it's a good way of getting people to work together. Uh, so, you know, you're digging, we're not getting the full super Nash equilibrium, but we're digging tunnels to, uh, to part of optimality. All right, so that's just a very, very generic idea on uh, blockchains and uh, self-amendment. I'm gonna speak a little more uh, specifically about Tezos. All right, I'm, I'm trying to uh, give a name to the uh, consensus algorithm because everyone has a name, so I've been toying with the name Emmy, which is in the same vein as the name Mikkelsen. Um, so uh, liquid proof of stake uh, consensus for Tezos. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of fancy words. Um, so, what is the general idea of the consensus algorithm in uh, in Tezos? So the idea is that we start from the Nakamoto consensus. That's the one used in Bitcoin, and then we say, okay, we have this consensus, but it's very expensive. It consumes a lot of energy, uh, and also it gives a lot of power to miners who are not necessarily the same people who use uh, the network. So how, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove proof of work and then we're going to have a whole lot of problems if we remove proof of work and then we're going to fix all those problems one by one. And so that's the general design approach. Uh, what you end up with is an algorithm that proceeds in cycles. Um, so a cycle is a set of, uh, is a set of blocks and typically it's going to be uh, 4,096 uh, blocks who each belong to a given slot. Uh, before a cycle, you determine a random seed, and we'll see how we do that. So picture yourself a cycle. You have uh, 4,019 slots. In each of these slots, you're going to be able to fit exactly one block, and you have a random seed at your disposal. OK. So to every slot, I'm going to attach a random priority list of block creators. So for slot number one, I'm going to use my random seed, and I'm going to say, OK, slot number one, is, um, is yours. But if you don't do it, then after a certain time, you can do it. 
And then if you can't do it after a certain time, you can do it. And these rights are granted randomly to anyone who holds any token. So if you own a token in proportion to the number of tokens you hold, you can be randomly selected to create a block within a slot. So that's a general idea. And we also impose that the slots are separated by at least a minute. Right? So a slot comes up, it's my turn. I create my block, I build on top of, you know, I'm honest, I build on the top of the previous block, and then it's the next slot. And then after another minute, someone else comes in and creates uh, another block until the end of the cycle. Another thing we do uh, for robustness is that once I create my block, you know, I want, I want to prove to everyone that I created my block. It makes it easier because if they're malicious players, they could pretend that I didn't create my block. And so in order to minimize those effects, we're going to randomly also select 32 person, 30, 32, um, we're going to select 32 stakeholders. So you draw uh, randomly across the set of all tokens, 32 values, and you look who owns them. And these people are going to get endorsement rights. So whenever I publish my block in my slots, there are people waiting to see this block, and they're going to say, oh, the block came. I'm signing the block, and it submits the signatures. So we have a block in every start that's um, ideally randomized by 32 um, randomly assigned uh, stakeholders. OK, so that's pretty straightforward. How do we get a random seed? You know, there's no, there's no randomness. We're running a deterministic protocol. So in proof of work, the uh, randomness is external in the sense that if you're just really, really hashing to solve a proof of work problem, you know, you're really focused about the partial collision and not the rest. And so the rest gives you a lot of, uh, of randomness that you can't really optimize for. Um, here, what we do is we use a commit reveal scheme to generate entropy. So you have different people commit to a random number and then reveal it at a later time. And you use a different reveal random numbers to, uh, to get some entropy together. Uh, and there's some subtleties around that. But that's a general idea. So you refresh your entropy. You have a, you have a cycle. You assign, the, you assign the rights. And then you keep going. And the, uh, the score of the chain is going to be essentially the total number of endorsements that you have on, uh, on this chain. Uh, and another optimization yet is that uh, if you're a block producer, if you're an endorser, you will have to put a safety deposit to prevent equivocation. Equivocation is when someone creates two blocks at the same height, because you want people to commit to one, to one version. So uh, before I create a block, I'll have to put up a deposit. I'll produce my block. And if anyone sees that I created another block at the same height, you know, they can, they can go and, and denounce me on the main chain and say, hey, that person created two blocks. They were only supposed to create one and I lose, my, uh, I lose my safety deposits. The safety deposits beyond the risk of equivocation, they also ensure that anyone who is actually uh, producing block and participating in the system is actually holding tokens and as in some sense a network's best interest at heart. So that's a um, general explanation of the algorithm. Uh, it's something that was designed in uh, around 2014, so proof of stake was very new. There's been a lot of research in proof of stake over the past, I would say, essentially uh, two, three years. Uh, and a lot of interesting results have come. You'll see there's a lot of impossibility results uh, above proof of stake. Uh, but you know, the devil is in the details. You have impossibility research for certain properties. But oftentimes, the properties that you care about are a slightly weaker version of the properties that you cannot obtain with proof of stake. So pros and cons of, uh, of this algorithm. So it converges very quickly uh, to consensus when the endorsers are reactive. Like the fact of having 32 endorsers that you sample randomly in a network, it, after a few blocks, after a few times that you've selected 32 random person, you've, you've selected a large fraction of the ownership base. And if they all agree on his history and they're, uh, and they're honest, they're unlikely to depart. So your blockchain is going to converge uh, pretty quickly. It has good liveness in the sense of uh, your blockchain is always going to keep making progress. If they're not reactive, you're still going to be able to get transactions through. You're still going to be able to get block. You're still going to be able to make progress. And also, uh, it has fair block creation rights. It uh, really insists on this. Uh, it's the idea in Tezos that uh, any, you know, if you own 1% of the tokens, you should be able to create 1% of the blocks. And that's something that's missing from a lot of uh, uh, other uh, proof of tech system. And Tezos works a lot to, uh, to try to achieve that. Uh, some, of the can, some of the cons of this uh, algorithm, um, there's no finality. So like in Bitcoin, you don't really know if a transaction uh, has been included forever in your ledger. You could have someone, in theory, come up with a longer chain or a better chain. 
And so statistically, it becomes very, very unlikely as time goes by that your chain will change, but you don't really know, uh, you don't really know for sure. And uh, the other one is just like Bitcoin, we also have here a synchronicity assumption. Uh, and that's the reason why, you know, why wait a minute, why not uh, a second, which is that you need an honest majority for the system to work. But if people can start delaying blocks and messages by more than a minute, then all of a sudden um, your honest majority uh, needs to become larger and larger, right? If you can delay message, like trivially, for example, if I can delay every message by two minutes, right? I can create my, and, and, and I have 25% of the network, uh, I create, so, I don't know, if I have 33% of the network, I'm going to create uh, blocks at one third the speed of the other guys, but then if I can slow the other guys who are doing a two thirds the speed by a factor half, because now they need two minutes to propagate their blocks, then they're going to go the same speed as I do. So if I can delay stuff by two minutes, um, now I need to have 66% uh, on its majority. So that's not really gr great because you're begging in this, as this assumption and it prevents you from going uh, faster, but you have some benefits in terms of, uh, of liveness. Uh, smart contracts in Tezos. So Tezos is a smart contract platform. I haven't uh, really mentioned that yet, but you know, being making money uh, on these platforms, you can also create uh, contracts where you're going to uh, uh, pro program that money and uh, programmatically agree on how it can be used. But you can also do more things. So people have used uh, smart contracts uh, to build games, uh, to build domain name systems, to build uh, all sorts of things. So the usual approach when you create a, a smart contract language and when I say usual, I mean, you know, those three or four approaches which have not been Tezos have been that you, you create a virtual machine, uh, you create, and then you have some high level language that people uh, program their contracts in and you'll compile down to the VM. Uh, and the benefits of doing this is you can, you can count the cost of operation very easily because you just count the steps in your virtual machine and it's very generic. You can have all the languages you want. You'll just comp like, compile down to that simple and minimal uh, VM. And the, tr you know, the downside of this is that if you want to really understand what you're doing, well, you need, first of all, a formal specification of the VM. That's not so hard to get. But you also need a formal specification of the high-level language and then you need a formally verified compiler to make sure that when you write a contract, you're going to get uh, what you expect. And the reason for that is uh, these contracts can hold hundreds of millions of dollars. And so the cost of bugs for these contracts is very, very high. And uh, it's not just if you have a bug, you don't just you know, uh, fix your compiler and do a new build. You can't really uh, change the smart contracts when they're deployed. So cost of errors is, is uh, enormous. And so what do we care about? For smart contracts, where we care primarily, we care about correctness enormously. Like we don't want our smart contract to have any uh, any issue. Uh, we care about verifiability. I also care about being able to prove everyone that my smart contract doesn't have any issue. It's not enough for me to be confident. Everyone is to be confident. Uh, we care about parsimony. So space is expensive uh, on the blockchain. It's at a premium. Everyone needs to keep everything that's on a blockchain uh, on their disk or even in memory if you want to be efficient. So we don't want to have uh, heavy programs. Performance, not really an issue because we're not running ray tracing here. We're, we're running simple uh, logic. Portability, not really an issue. You're just, you know, you're, you're mainly running on your own, uh, on your own blockchain. You're not going to be running it on like a dozen different platform. So yeah, it's business logic, not pretty unfolding. So the design goals for the, uh, for the language in, uh, in Tezos was that it should be generic. Like you want to be able to do anything. So you don't want to just start with like a domain specific language for uh, contracts or finance or anything like that because you can use smart contracts for many different things and you, you don't want to uh, take too, too strong of a view of what it's going to be used for. Uh, you want something that's safe uh, and that means at least uh, type safe. You want something that's readable because people will look at the contract and try to understand uh, what it's doing and you want easy gas accounting. So. You want to have a sense of uh, to count the resources that the execution of a contract is, uh, is using. So there's a tension here, because if you want something generic with easy gas accounting, well, you want this assembly-like language. You want this VM approach. But if you want safe and readable, you want something like a high-level functional language. And so Mikkelsen, which is a language for Tezos, is a compromise. It's a low-level language, but it has high-level primitives. Uh, it's stack-based for uh, easier gas calculation, so it doesn't have any variables. 
But you have annotations, which are uh, pretty helpful. It's statically typed, it's functional, and it's a little bit lispy. So this is Mikkelsen on the postcard. This is everything you have in, uh, in Mikkelsen. So you know, we have some, uh, some nice data types, uh, like natural number. So natural number, that's, uh, that's a positive integer. Uh, no bound, so you're not going to have any overflow bugs in, uh, in Mikkelsen. We have an integer, so na an integer could be negative. Or again, you know, by default, uh, no bound. Timestamps, signatures, hashes, contract, amounts, all of these are, are, are typed separately. And then you can build more complex type by using um, either left, right to create some types uh, or pairs. And we also have a, a sum and none. So you have all of these uh, nice types. You can also create uh, uh, structures like uh, maps. You can, even, uh, you can also create lambdas. So this is a fairly high level uh, language. At the same time, you will see something that's more like assembly like, at least for a stack machine, like drop, dupe, swap, push, all of this type of, uh, of operations. And then you'll have the, uh, you'll have, do I even have them here? Yeah, you'll have the weird loops. Um, uh, that we have on the on the chain. I, I think that the uh, the instruction data has changed has changed slightly since I did this uh, this slide. So it's basically a fairly small language, but you can do a lot, you can do a lot with it. Uh, here's an example. So you know there'll be presentation going more into Mikkelsen, but I'm just giving you a, a quick overview. Oh, that's an old example. We don't return anything anymore. Uh, I need to update my slides. So in this example, you have a, uh, a map, which maps strings to natural integers, and you return a, uh, well, you don't return anything anymore. And you have a parameter which is a string. So here, uh, you grab the amount that was sent to the contract, and then you, uh, you give it a little tag. Uh, you push the amount five, because what was required uh, to play with this contract is to push at least five. You compare, and um, if five is greater than what was sent, then you fail. That's not good. And uh, otherwise, you do a lot of stack manipulation uh, in order to get your storage. You grab, uh, this, you know, you, you grab this string from your uh, from your map, um, and uh, if it's uh, if it's not there, uh, you fail. Also, otherwise, you're going to push the integer one. You're going to add it, uh, and then you update your map. And so, basically, what you can do with this thing is people can pay five, and they can vote on island, not island, or boat. Uh, that was a slide for a. Uh, uh, a financial crypto conference where they wanted to vote on whether or not uh, it was okay to do it on not an island, which is a, a tradition, or on a boat. So, anyway, that's saying uh, that's a very simple example of Mikkelsen. So, you know, it makes fairly understandable and readable parts with annoying uh, uh, stack manipulation, uh, as you'll see. But once you use an IDE, it gets a, a, lot, a lot easier to uh, to work with. Okay. So that's a brief presentation of Tezos. Uh, let me speak a little bit about the road ahead uh, and stuff which are coming in, uh, in Tezos. So first of all is security. So Tezos has been in development for a while. It's been live for a few months. Uh, but you know, if you don't have security, you don't have anything here. And so uh, improving uh, what we have, improving the security of what we have is, uh, is paramount. So that can mean just, you know, like, Keep writing more tests, keep doing more checks. Uh, there's also uh, things that we know uh, uh, could be improved, and we know how to improve them, but they just uh, need to be improved. Uh, but if we're looking just like beyond that, just like um, formal verification of the code. So part of our codes are already formally verified. Uh, the libraries we use for cryptography, uh, some of them come from um, Hacklestar, which is a project for a star implementation of, uh, of primitives. We also rely heavily on the OCaml type system to make proofs. So for example, uh, the Mikkelsen, uh, 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 the, the, the way the, the, the Mikkelsen programs are composed, uh, they are well typed and that's ensured by the uh, OCaml JDT. So if the OCaml JDT implementation is correct, then we know that any Mikkelsen program that you can get in the protocol is going to be well typed. So there, there's some usage of the type system, but beyond that, being able to formally verify some of the modules uh, of the code. So is you're formally verifying directly the code, or even taking things like the consensus algorithm, modeling it, and having formal proofs about the model of the consensus algorithm, all of these things would be very helpful. Upgrade the consensus algorithm. Like I said, you know, the consensus we have is from 2014. I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And as far as chain-based proof of stake goes, 
uh, it's pretty state of the art. Uh, you'll probably hear about uh, Cardano and Ouroboros, so they have a lot of uh, published paper and, and, and peer-reviewed uh, papers around Ouroboros. Um, the proof of safety that they have for their uh, algorithm pretty much apply to uh, to Tezos, but we have a lot more protections uh, against uh, uh, selfish block creation and a lot of protections of, for fairness, faster conversions. So we have nice properties. You know, I think it's competitive with what's out there, but it's important to look um, to look ahead and and get something that's really really state of the art and uh, and well proven. So that's for the security aspects. Privacy. I mentioned how. Like important privacy is, and right now, Tezos doesn't do anything uh, for uh, for privacy. So the first thing would be to have private transactions, uh, and there are uh, techniques that can be used from other projects, like Zero Cash, for example. Uh, sorry, Zero Cash is a paper. Zcash is a project. So Zcash has uh, really nice private transactions using zero knowledge proofs. So importing these techniques. But going beyond that, private votes. Right now, all the votes in Tezos are public. I think we'd benefit to have uh, more uh, private votes and there's cryptographic primitives that can be used to do that. So some, like the homomorphic encryption is typically difficult in, uh, in cryptography, but for votes, you're only adding stuff. So if you're just adding and not multiplying, you have a somewhat easier scheme. Um, and going even beyond that, private smart contracts, where it's not just a transaction, but like any smart contract that you, um, that you want be able to just Put it on the blockchain, and then the blockchain just verifies that the contract is correct, but doesn't try, but but doesn't have to have knowledge of the contract itself. Scaling. So, um, paradoxically, at the, you know, at, at the same time, there's a little adoption of, 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 of cryptocurrencies. It's still uh, it's still niche, but the people who do adopt it have been uh, needing more. Uh, more throughput, more transactions uh, per second. It's been, you know, hitting capacity on Bitcoin. It's been hitting capacity on uh, on Ethereum. So, increasing the throughput uh, is something that can be done simply with the existing algorithm. Simply by uh, cleaning up some stuff, uh, making the uh, make, uh, make, make, making the the, the, <coughs> the nodes more efficient. We can just like just put more transactions on it, uh, having smaller representations for transactions. So, there's a lot of very low hanging fruit here for source throughput. Uh, more fancy stuff, we can um, scale with um, non-interactive zero knowledge proofs of knowledge. So the general idea is that instead of putting transactions in blocks, you now uh, just put a single proof that there are transactions that exist, which have a certain effect. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to have a very large witness for all the transactions. You can have a constant size, a constant size witness using uh, zero knowledge proofs. So you can, you, you can cram a, a lot of transaction into um, a few bytes. So that's very, very powerful, uh, but, still very, but still largely inefficient because these proofs are expensive to create. Sharding. Uh, sharding is a technique where instead of just having one blockchain, you have uh, many blockchain that go their different ways and get reconciled once in a while uh, without the need for everyone to validate every blockchain. So there's a lot of um, technical difficulties with that. I'm, uh, I'm more interested in these two scaling approaches, but uh, some of that is being researched for, uh, for Tezos at Cornell, and I think there are uh, really good proposals coming for, for sharding. So different approaches. And um, no, I don't, have a, I don't have a conclusion slide. So that's basically uh, some of the road ahead for, uh, for Tezos. Um, and uh, my general presentation, like I said, I want to leave time for, uh, for questions uh, at the end, because I probably covered stuff that uh, of you already knew, and I probably went too fast on stuff that you don't necessarily know. So uh, please, if you have any questions, let me know. Or rather, I've learned, uh, I've learned something. You don't ask, you know, do you have any questions? You ask, what are your questions? Or I'll start naming, I'll start naming volunteers. <laughs> All right, Diego, why don't you start? So uh, my question is, uh, in the roadmap, we have to create a consensus algorithm. Uh, and uh, what are the elements that you think that in the current consensus algorithm are weak and that should be uh, considered a priority? Well, I'm a f I, 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 I've, ch I've changed my mind over the what? Oh, yes, yes. So the question is, you know, I mentioned changes to the consensus algorithm. What part of the consensus algorithm do you think I are weak and need replacement? So there are several things. 
Uh, I think that it's um, I think that it's a weakness that we don't ha that it's so. Let me rephrase it. The consensus algorithm in Tezos takes a belt and suspender approach by trying to by by using a lot of different tricks for from uh, different papers in order to just pile on safety. You know, we'll create blocks in a certain we'll create blocks in a certain way. You know, if if you create you could have proof sets of correctness of the algorithms without using endorsements just by adding blocks one after the uh, uh, the other, and you, you could get safety arguments uh, from that. Uh, but you know, we add endorsements because heuristically it will give you faster conversions, uh, and heuristically it will give you uh, less um, uh, less selfish mining. Likewise, we use uh, a system of tracking roles in order to make sure that we don't randomly assign the rights to just certain accounts, but we, we track the ownership of the token so that if someone tries to do a, a chain on the side, like a, a secret fork, they can only do it using the tokens they own and not look like they have a, a, a wider variety of, uh, of, uh, of token to use for. So there's a lot of heuristic tricks that are used. And the problem is that we like a, um, we like a good formal specification of the algorithm. And it's a problem not so much because I think it makes it, it's not so much about the safety of it, which I, you know, I, I, I think there's really strong arguments for. It's more that you can't really tweak it if you don't have a model you can run it through if you don't know what the limits are. So for example, I think it would be interesting that the endorsements for a block could be included not just in the next block, but in the three following blocks. So that if the next block refuses to include endorsements in order to make the chain weaker than it should be, then it could be included in the next few blocks. So if I think about that, heuristically, it seems like a good idea. But at the end of the day, you don't really know until you have a model where you can actually try this out. Now, it doesn't have actually have to be a mathematical model. It can be really good simulation as long as you have really realist realistic attackers in the simulation. But of course, the gold standard is a mathematical model. So Having really good mathematical model of these things makes it uh, easier to really, really understand what your limits are. You know how fast. Uh, so you have a, a synchronicity assumption uh, in Tezos, but how exactly does the um, how exactly does uh, does the chain uh, react to delays in the network? Maybe it's something you can observe uh, in the rate of endorsements, and so maybe it's uh, less, of a, uh, less of a problem. Knowing this exactly, you get it from simulation, you get it from modeling. So we don't have that, so, and that's I think is a, uh, that I think is an issue. Uh, going beyond that, um, so the synchronicity is annoying because you always have to do uh, you always have to make assumptions about uh, the state of the network, and they are. A synchronous protocol out there. They're a weekly synchronous protocol and they're asynchronous protocol. And the nice thing about this is that you can go really fast because if you if you can't make assumptions about the network, you have to be conservative. You have to say, I'm going to wait a long time before I consider that this person did not produce their blocks. If on the other hand, you're not dependent on these assumptions, then you can be very optimistic. You can try to go really, really fast, as fast as you want. And then if somehow you know, you're, if somehow the network has delays, then you have delay. So you want the delays in your chain not to be worst case, but to actually reflect the state of the network. And improving upon that is, uh, is very helpful. So the weekly synchronous algorithm and asynchronous algorithms that exist, uh, they are typically algorithms that also provide fin fin finality. So you, you know, on, on a given block, you'll know that the block has been accepted by the honest majority of the, uh, uh, of the bakers. And that's, uh, that's essentially why uh, you get uh, uh, this property of, uh, of not depending on network delays, is because well, if there's network delays, you might not get your block for a while. But once you get it, you know that sets. You know that it's not because you haven't received another message, because that's the only message that you like, could potentially uh, receive. So these are interesting. These don't scale as well to very large uh, number of users. There's interesting proposals uh, of using sortition, for example, uh, uh, to use subsets of uh, large subsets of, um, of validators uh, in order to create blocks. So, I, you know, I, I to 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 go back to your question, I think lack lack of a good formal specification and model that we can use to uh, tweak. And understand better. And the second one is, and I, but, but that's for just old chain based algorithm, uh, the, the, the timing assumptions.
Jérôme <laughs> Right. No one has any question? Everyone understood everything? All right. So, Nicolas Resident first, and Benjamin, you next. About the privacy on Tezos. Yeah. I uh, know it was planned uh, for Tezos. I don't know if the market wants that. Uh, is it? Yes, is it planned on the roadmap to develop the privacy on Tezos? Is it what? Is it planned to, to develop the privacy on Tezos? On whose roadmap? <laughs> so, this is what I think is important. <laughs> So yeah, sorry, Nicolas' question is, uh, is it planned on a roadmap to, uh, to develop privacy on, uh, on Tezos? And so my answer is, uh, whose roadmap? So this is my presentation. This is what I think is important. You guys are going to want, you know, you, you, you guys are, are, are going to work on, on what you're working on. I suggest that. I think it's important. I think it's, I think it's cool. I think it's going to make a difference. Right now, there's this type of segmentation that people do in this market. Where they say like, well, you know, some projects they're platforms, they're smart contract platforms, and some of them are currency, and some of them are private currencies, and and they look at them as if they were distinct categories, even though there's nothing that prevents uh, anyone from just like being in all of these categories at the same time. So I, I think it's a very important uh, privacy is a very important prop. Uh, property to have, and it has, it has benefit beyond privacy, like scale, it has benefit in scalability, um, it has uh, benefits in fungibility, so that you know, all the tokens are the same. If, if, if you can have um, anonymity, then all the tokens are essentially the same, because you can't just like, track them and say, like, oh, it's this one versus this one. It also has benefits in censorship resistance, because if you can have uh, anonymous transactions, then you can't just say, like, I'm going to refuse your transactions because I don't like you. So, to me, it's very important. Uh, can you say a little bit more about open law? So I saw that uh, there's a grant given in, I forgot what research. Open law? Yeah. Not familiar with that. So the Thesis Foundation gives out grants. I remember they mentioned the grants to close, which does uh, legal smart contracts. The what? Accordion project. Accordion? And Ergo. Clause. Clause, yeah. Uh, I don't know, so... Um, I mean, if it's just like to have, to go from Nicholson to their language, or...? No, they're building a compiler from their language to Mikkelsen. So one thing I didn't mention about Mikkelsen is it's also a, a, a pretty good compilation target. But I, I, I don't know the details of the, uh, of the closed project. And how about the regulations? I saw that uh, France is one of the pioneers looking how to, what's the status of blockchains? Like, uh, for instance, with GDPR and uh, 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 Like they say that oh, yeah, the sure. problem, uh, basically, like the right to be forgotten if you have right. so so the question is about uh, GDPR regulation and how that interact with blockchain and the right to be forgotten and, uh, and so on and so forth. I, I, I don't think anyone really knows at this point. Uh, I don't think the regulators know and the lawyers aren't sure and uh, the people building blockchains aren't sure. I mean, so far it's, it doesn't, I, I think it's mostly going to be incumbent on the platform uh, <coughs> developers. Like if I build a smart contract and and people put their information in a smart contract. As a developer of the smart contract, it's my responsibility to make sure that you know I can I, I can comply with uh, with the things I don't. But but the uh, the idea on the blockchain is not really to put some uh, the idea on the blockchain is not really to put some personal information. Like I don't there, there's some you sometimes hear these speeches about oh you know we'll put your personal information on a blockchain, that way you own it. Like, how do you own it? You just made it public. So that doesn't make a, a whole lot of sense. Uh, I know that, I think, well, I read that GDPR uh, was okay with deleting private keys as a way of deleting data. So if you had a private key for something that was encrypted and you delete the private keys, that's like deleting the data. Uh, so there, there, there are solutions around it, but for most of the use cases, which I think are going to, are going to be on a blockchain, I, I, I don't think, uh, is going to be that impacted by uh, by GDPR. I also don't think that GDPR applies to the case of like, you know, I wrote a check to this merchant and I want this merchant to forget that I wrote a check. Uh, I guess you should try to have some contact with people 
people working on this? Like, okay, what would be the status such that you share your point of view with them, such that they, I mean, since they have difficulties classifying it, or what should it be? Maybe they should interact more with blockchain developers such that they're yeah, that would be great. Well, you know, if, if, if there's any uh, regular who's interested in, uh, in discussing the interaction of GDPR and, uh, and, 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 and blockchain technology, I'm happy to explain what the uh, blockchain technology is like on the blockchain side. But, um. So, we, we, who is watching us remotely from, um, I don't know where, but uh, two questions. Uh, one of her, her questions was pretty similar, which was, will normal people be able to write legal smart contracts in the future? And I think the closed project will probably uh, it, uh, it, uh, give us a little bit of answer. I think so. The second one, I think, uh, is a good introductory question, because I think a lot of us here in this room uh, ask what, uh, so we understood technically what this object is, but what do we do with it? And um, one question was um, about, we hear a lot about uh, running a healthcare system on top of a blockchain. Yeah. How would you do that? Okay, so three questions. Um, first one is, will normal people be able to write these legal smart contracts? The second one is, you know, what, what are some of these use cases? And the third one is, you hear a lot about putting healthcare on a blockchain. What, you know, what, what is that going to look like? So for the first one, you know, so um, actually, uh, the people behind Close have a uh, partnership recently with LegalZoom. LegalZoom is this website where you can do things like, uh, I think you can do things like a will or like starting a company or all that. And, and you know, the particularities of the type of contracts that they do is that they're very, very standard and cookie cutter, right? If you, uh, if you write a, a, a rental agreement with someone, you really only have to put in a few parameters to your rental agreements and decide if you want this term or that term or that term, you know? It's like, I've been to this website for lease agreements and it's like, okay, uh, should the tenants pay for replacing keys and then how much, you know, how many days for late payments and so on and so forth. And I think we'll see a lot of that. I, I don't think uh, people are gonna be writing um, directly, uh, con like just anyone is just gonna be writing contracts in the same way that I wouldn't write my own lease, but I, I think you'll have uh, templates uh, and parameters that people can uh, that people can use. In terms of applications on the blockchain, um, so more than the big DApps, which are popular in Ethereum, where it's like let's run an entire program on the blockchain. I I, I think simple uh, small financial contracts are going to be valuable, like small insurance uh, contracts. <coughs> I um, I had an issue with uh, with a car I rented uh, back in January. Uh, and, the car, and, I, and I bought the insurance uh, when I rented the car. And I called them and they said they would pay and I've been trying to get them to pay by email for more than six months. And so if, uh, you know, if, if at the very least it had been a smart contract where you know, they would have to commit, because they don't want to tell me that they're not going to pay, but they also like, just keep delaying and delaying and delaying. So if this thing was in a smart contract, it would force them to actually uh, go ahead and acknowledge that uh, something is out. So, like tying, uh, like bringing some visibility in uh, in, uh, in claim processing, I think uh, would be uh, would be helpful. Also, smaller ticket items, you know, ensuring something for a value of like a hundred dollars or, or or even ten dollars. That's not something you can really do uh, uh, nowadays. So for me, that's an interesting application. So other ones which are not necessarily financial uh, domain name systems, for example, right now. Um, DNS is uh, is controlled only by uh, by a few entities. It's not very uh, it's not very secure. And having a better system for uh, uh, for names and uh, strikes me as a better uh, strikes me as a better approach. Uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, approach to uh, PKI. So the web of trust systems for uh, for keys hasn't uh, really worked very well, but. Uh, a system on a blockchain where you can actually have uh, uh, an identity and then uh, attach keys to it might be uh, might be a better fit. Uh, so the question regarding healthcare, you know, are healthcare records going to be put on a blockchain? I just don't see it. Uh, people talk a lot about it. I don't know too much about the healthcare markets. Obviously, they would not put your actual healthcare records. So what? You know, they're going to put like a hash 
of your healthcare record on a blockchain, and then so so what? Uh, there's a tendency in some industries to use a blockchain as a stone soup. So the story of the stone soup is that someone comes into a village with a pot and a stone, and they go in the center of the village, and uh, and at first they, they go to the villagers and they ask for food, and no one wants to give them food. So they set up a small fire, they put their pots with water, and they start boiling the stone. And the villagers are very curious, and they go to the person and they say, well, what are you doing? And they say, oh, I'm doing stone soup. It's delicious. It's going to be great. And they're like, are you sure? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you know, like stone soup is delicious. It's even better with a little bit of carrots. And so the villager says, like, well, I'll spare a carrot. You know, here's a, here's a carrot. And then someone else comes by and they bring a potato and then uh, they, bring a, so they bring some meat and they bring some salt and all of that. And at the end, they drink the soup and they're like, it's delicious. And the guy says, yes. And not only that, you can reuse the stone. So there's a lot of fragmentation in a lot of markets, uh, financial <coughs> markets, probably the healthcare market as well. They need a, um, an overhaul of their IT solutions. And I think sometimes some, some vendors are coming in with what essentially are like, reasonable solution and just calling it blockchain to get uh, the, uh, the, the middle managers or CEOs to sign off, to sign off on it and get it, get it adopted. Uh, a recent example is, uh, you know, I think it's Walmart said, you know, they, they deploy this uh, Hyperledger blockchain. Uh, I, it's an IBM solution. And they said, all right, now everyone who sells this lettuce has to put everything on the blockchain. And some people are saying like, oh my goodness, that's, you know, that's like, oh, now with blockchain, they can track the provenance of lettuce in three seconds. Yeah, but like the way this works is because Walmart is compelling all of these vendors to input their data into a single system. The blockchain doesn't actually do anything for it. But maybe they were better able to convince the ledger producers by saying like, oh, it's blockchain. So there's some of that going on, definitely. Um, and I think that maybe what's going on with healthcare. But I, I could be too cynical. Anything else? No, yes. Oh, wow. All right, you first, and then Chris. Um. Do people write their contracts in Microsoft directly, or do they prefer uh, high-level alternative like liquidity? Oh, they all prefer high-level alternatives. So uh, liquidity was a language developed by OCaml Pro that compiles down to Mikkelsen. It, it's pretty much a subset of, uh, of OCaml. Uh, so people have been using liquidity. Mikkelsen is not, I think there's only a few people in the world who have written Mikkelsen contracts. Uh, I grew to like it. Uh, and the thing is, it's like you're going to write a contract, right? You're going to spend so much time verifying it, understanding what it does, and it's going to be a few lines. The overhead of writing it in Mikkelsen, I don't think is, I, I, I don't think it's very large. And if you look, you know, I, uh, there's, for example, uh, we have an example of an atomic swap. And an atomic swap is when you, uh, you exchange some tokens from one blockchain to another. So there's an example in Mikkelsen that's uh, fairly compact. Uh, of an atomic swap, and you look at it, and it's fairly readable. Uh, and then there's one which was done in liquidity, which is popular, which is about like 10 times the size uh, once compiled. So, I mean, compilers can be uh, compilers can be improved, but there, there, there's something to be said about writing in uh, in Mikkelsen. I think most people will will not end up writing in Mikkelsen. I think they will end up writing in uh, in high level languages when they when they develop their applications. But then it will be some very very specialized application that will do direct to Mikkelsen. Like, let's say you're writing a wallet, for example, and you want some multi-sig ones. You just spend, you know, you'll, you'll invest the time and effort to really get it in Mikkelsen and really, really optimized. Because you can actually do that. You can hand-optimize Mikkelsen. You cannot hand-optimize EVM code for, uh, uh, for Ethereum. So some highly used, highly deployed contract will be like this. And then when someone just says, like, oh, try out my new dApps, they will probably not use Mikkelsen for that. Do we have proof of compilation from uh, liquidity to Mikkelsen? Nope, no. Yeah. So building a certified compiler would be helpful, but also you know more than so liquidity is uh, is ML which is nicer than uh, than doing Mikkelsen. But I think a lot of people would like something like a simple, statically typed kind of imperative language would be uh, would be very helpful for most uh, for most people. Something like a Python or a Pascal. My question was uh, more market-oriented perspective, I would say, about uh, things I heard that the OECD and uh, wanted to take on this. 
uh, what do you think about the combinations between you know, permissionless and permission blockchains and also private versus public blockchains? This was discussed a lot. Right, so the question is about permissionless versus uh, permission blockchain, private versus public blockchain. So there's there's some um, there, there's some dispute about what people mean by permissionless. So for me, uh, you know, if if, if 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 there's not a set of like people who are the one who control a blockchain and anyone can really join and participate, for me that's permissionless. They are. Uh, uh, very strong Bitcoin proponents that will tell you that if you're not using proof of work, it's not permissionless because in proof of work, anyone can come in with a CPU and create blocks. Not really true. You know, you need to buy like you, you, you're never going to create a block unless you really buy like specialized equipments from a few vendors. Uh, whereas in proof of stake, you need to buy tokens. And so, what if no one ever buys your token? Then you can't participate. Not really real stake, but. So that's sometimes when people talk about permissionless and permission, they talk about the consensus. For me, it's more about like, are you allowed to deploy a smart contract? You know, if anyone's allowed to just go out and deploy smart contracts and use it as they want, that's what it means to be permissionless. Uh, on, on the contrary, permission or private blockchains are uh, going to be used by a small consortium of people, uh, and uh, uh, they don't let you know they're not going to let anyone else in. It's a finite number of, of people. So several questions about permissionless. Permission blockchain. Uh, are they useful? So a lot of permission blockchain, there are situations like the Walmart type of situation where it doesn't really do anything. There are situations though when I do think that there's a place for, for permission blockchain in some contests, uh, m mostly consortiums. So if you have a consortium of enterprises that don't really trust each other, and also you have a political problem, you don't, you know, you could maybe solve it with having a database run, but not, you know, but every one of them is going to want to da run a database and run it their way. And one way to cut the Gordon knot is to say, okay, no one has it. So we're going to run a replicated ledger. Okay. So that's one, that's one way of solving the, the problem. And you get nicer properties with a blockchain that you don't get immediately with a database, like the auditability of it, uh, uh, being, be, be, you know, uh, being the, the cryptographic auditability of it. So there are some benefits. So I, I do believe there are real benefits. When you are in a situation where you get real benefits from a permission blockchain, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to use a permissionless blockchain. Like, you're, you're going to be you're, you're going to be better off. It really depends on your threat models. But if you are a bunch of letters producers trying to produce uh, letters and you form a consortium and you use this blockchain, um, the type of scenarios that you get protected against in public blockchains is so different than what can can match. I mean, you know, if you have one letters producers that starts misbehaving and you know you know you know who they are and you go to them and you say like, hey. You're creating a bunch of blocks that we don't like. We're kicking you out of a consortium, and that's bad. So you have all these human institutions that can come in and uh, and help you out. So there's not a really a big benefit. I think the benefits of using a public blockchain is when you want to be truly global, so that you want to be available everywhere, uh, very widely. You know, it's not just a consortium of a dozen people, but potentially uh, thousands and thousands of people across many different ju um, uh, jurisdictions and countries uh, interacting with each other. That's where it makes sense to have uh, public blockchains. Yeah. Oh, so. Does it make more sense to have for private ones, like okay, the permission one, financial applications or whatever, and you have permission measures, and then it makes sense, much more sense to have smart contracts than everybody deploys the same. So you're saying that it makes a lot more sense to have smart contracts on uh, private ledgers than on a public ledger? I don't think I agree. I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. If, um, again, if you're trying to uh, interact with many, uh, with many different people across many different uh, jurisdictions in a permissionless setting, you do want smart contracts. They're very, uh, they, they're very useful, and you're not gonna, and, and and you still need to have those. So you know, they're useful on, on in a private setting. They're useful in a public setting as well. So, yeah, right. So what you're saying is every node participating has to deploy the contract. So that goes back to the idea of, uh, of sharding, where essentially you're saying, OK, maybe not everyone needs to run everything and validate everything, because that doesn't scale very well. And the idea is that say, well, you know, let's say maybe we'll have 10 blockchains, uh, and then 
the contracts can live on different blockchains and then you can validate on a single one and you have economic incentives for the validators of different blockchains to uh, synchronize once in a while and make sure and, and kind of you kind of trust the work of the other of the other one and that, that could come in different forms um, one blockchain could exchange with the other one uh, a zero knowledge proof that it's done its job correctly and then now you don't have to validate it because they validated it for you so that's one solution another solution would be economic incentives so you have different ways of having shared security between uh, a lot of different blockchains. Another approach also is layer two solutions. So you don't really build on a blockchain directly. So you and I want to enter a contract instead of just doing everything on a blockchain, we enter the contract privately. And what we, but but we, we, we tell the blockchain about the contract, maybe we put a hash of the contract on the blockchain. And only if we have a dispute over the contract, do we take the dispute to the blockchain. So you know, we, we, we do our transactions and then you refuse to, Hmm? Off-chain, off -chain, yeah. So we do we do an off-chain contract together, and you're supposed to pay me some uh, some money you don't pay to me, and so we keep track of all our interactions. We run a mini like kind of blockchains between the two of us. It's just transactions signed back and forth. And if you cheat, I go to the blockchain and I say, well, we had a contract. You know, we told you about this hash. Well, here's the contract. Here's the content of the contract, and here's the content of our transaction. It looks, she cheated, and you had to put a performance bond at the beginning and then uh, I get paid out with a uh, performance bond. So there are ways to do off-chain contracts like this without... Are they trying with Casper? Are they trying with Casper? So Casper is uh, Ethereum's uh, approach to proof of stake and it's, uh, it's been referring to about half a dozen different designs. So the latest design for Casper, if I understand, is that they have some underlying blockchain uh, which run some way, maybe it's a light proof of work, maybe something. So they run a fast blockchain, and then once every 100 block or something like this, they get to Byzantine uh, agreement over, uh, over a branch of the, uh, of the chain that's the main ID. And then they're also doing sharding, and they're trying to do sharding at the same time as Casper, and so now they call it Shasper. And again, they've tried to do different approaches for sharding. Uh, so that's one of the things they're doing, but that's sharding. For off-chain contracts, one of the things that uh, Ethereum has been proposing has been Plasma. But Plasma doesn't really work for smart contracts. It kind of works only for some stuff like decentralized exchanges or like just having another, uh, another token. So there's not a whole lot of, uh, I would say the closest thing to a completely option smart contract would be something like Truebit, which was proposed for, uh, for Ethereum. So there's, there's different approaches. A lot of people are talking about that. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, there's, um, there's low-hanging fruits for throughputs that haven't really been uh, been picked before we uh, we get to this type of optimization. Uh, when I have talked with uh, Diego a while back, uh, he put what we just talked about in a nice way, saying that uh, basically you have to view the blockchain as a distributed courtroom where you only involve other people if you have a problem on a contract. What you were saying that basically you. Yeah, so... If I update this notes of the contract, and you see it as a sort of courtroom where everything is deterministic, so if you lose, you're going to lose. Yeah, so what you're saying is that you can use the, the, the blockchain just as a courtroom where you just adjudicate contracts. You don't really like run your transactions or your contracts. You just do whatever you want on the side, and then you just go back if there's a problem. So that you know that, that that's that's definitely an interesting vision, uh, and I, I think there's a lot of truth to it for contracts. The downside is that you need to put up performance bonds, and so you have to lock capital that might not otherwise be uh, uh, be locked. So that's that's part of the uh, that's part of the uh, the, 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 the potential. Uh, Downsides. I, I, I think there's. I, I think that's part of the that's part of the vision. But I, I'm not. I, I don't think it has to be just radically just that. I think you can have some activity on the blockchain itself, and do uh, do different things. Uh, one question that came up a couple of times uh, during my visit in Italy is why Nicholson is Turing complete. For them, uh, Turing complete is so 80s. It's something old, and uh, and so I mean there was. Uh, Something that I couldn't really explain. What is the design choice was taken at the beginning? Mm -hmm. so like you know, your take if yeah. it evolved in something more less uh, less. Uh, Absolutely. So the question is like, why is uh, Mikkelsen Turing complete? That's so eighties. Uh, and uh, here's my answer. So I have a blog post where I talk about that. Actually called uh, uh, Turing completeness was framed. 
uh, where I talk about this. And there's also a very good presentation at PBase 16, I think, of uh, uh, Andrew Miller on Ethereum is not very complete and it doesn't matter anyway. So I recommend those. Uh, I recommend those two things. But I'll, I'll resume. I'll recap the argument very quickly. The first thing is that uh, Megazone is not Turing complete because you have to pay gas for your operations and you have a finite amount of gas. So it is bound in time. And so because it's bound in time, it's not Turing complete. Now, what is the problem with uh, Turing completeness? The problem with Turing completeness is uh, Rice theorem is that you cannot. Uh, you cannot have a general algorithm that will prove, uh, that will be able to check non-trivial properties of any program, like termination, for example. Um, the problem is that some people believe that the converse of Rice theorem is true. What they believe, essentially, is that if you're Turing complete, then you cannot prove anything about any specific program. And of course, that's not true. The vast majority of programs which have ever been written uh, can be proven. Uh, many properties can be proven about them because programmers mostly care about writing contracts, where writing programs that they can prove work. You know, even if you're not doing a formal proof, you have some proof in your head that this thing is going to do something. So, what happens if you write a program that doesn't work, where your proof is wrong? Okay, then you've then you've written a bad contract. Okay, so you shouldn't be writing bad contracts. That 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 makes sense. But then you're only really hurting yourself and the people hurting your contracts. So. At the, you know, at, at, the, at the system level, it might be bad reputation if you have bad contracts, but you're not really hurting the blockchains. You will, will, you'll be cut after a certain amount of gas execution step, and that's it. You know, that's, your, that, that's your problem. If you write contracts where you can prove a whole lot of properties, that's great. If you want to prove termination uh, of your contracts and then show everyone, hey, my contract terminates, that's great. You can do that. So really what matters is not so much how, you know, is this Turing complete, but how is it to prove properties above this contract, right? And so one property you might want to care about is, hey, you know, maybe I don't care about termination, but I care about termination in T-steps. Would, it would be great if I could prove easily that my thing is going to terminate quickly and not consume too much gas. It would be great if I could prove that my thing is not going to spend uh, uh, too much money is really great if I can prove that no one can steal money from my thing. But that, I think, has a lot more to do with language design than Turing uh, completeness. It's true that the languages that tend to be not Turing complete, you know, you'll, you, you, depending on how they're designed, you might have algorithms that makes them easier to decide. But even something like Bitcoin, so you know, Bitcoin script is not Turing complete, uh, obviously. It's a very simple script. However, uh, a simple, I can do a simple Bitcoin program, which is pay anyone who comes up with a pre-image of that hash. That's a very simple Bitcoin script. Can anyone, you know, and like, but if I do that, will anyone be able to know if this contract is executable? You know, how, well, no one knows if there's a pre-image of that hash, and it would be exponentially hard to uh, to find if there is. So how is it? You know, you could also just say, well, I'll simulate every possible input to that smart contract and see if they terminate. So you know, it, it, in practice, it. Um, it's really about how easy it is to reason about your language. Now, I'll, 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 I'll give one, uh, one uh, I'll give a counter to what I've been saying, uh, which is um, there's a, a protocol called Zen, Zen Protocol. And what they do is that when you submit a smart contract, you have to submit a proof of boundness, like that it will terminate in less than T steps. So why do we care about that? Because you can just use gas. Well, the thing is, like, then you don't have to use gas. That's the beauty of it. If you're guaranteed that your program is going to run an SNT step, you don't have to instrument your code and count the steps at every time, which is less efficient. You can just you know, compile it and run it very efficiently because you've, all, you know, you've already convinced yourself, you've seen a proof that it would be very, uh, that, that you will always run an SNT step. So that's very, uh, uh, that's potentially uh, interesting uh, approach. But in general, um, I also think that executing contract is something that's going to disappear, right? Because in one model, you submit an input to a contract, and then the blockchain validator executes a contract and gets the output. But another model that would not involve any execution would be for you to just send the entire trace, execution trace of your contract. You know, you start with the input, you execute the entire trace, you get the output, and you submit that. 
now they you know now they don't need to execute any Turing complete steps. You just need to verify that every step in your trace is uh, is correct. Now that's very uh, that's very easy, but that's expensive because you still have to like pass this giant trace. But you could get a zero knowledge uh, witness, and you could get that in a log uh, in log of the size of your trace. So. Let's say that we care only about programs which finish in less than two to the 64 steps, which is most programs we care about. Uh, you could have a, basically a constant size proof, a very small proof that says, OK, I executed this contract. This is the outcome. When you just send that, and then the proof that your outcome is correct. And then if you do that, then you really don't care about uh, Turing completeness at all. You only care insofar as, you know, for yourself, insofar as you want to write a, a good contract. Yeah. And also to uh, rebound on this, it's also convenient to have a Turing complete language uh, to target from. It's also a good idea to have a Turing complete language to target for compilation from a DSL that is not as well. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. So you say it's, it's a good idea to have a Turing langu language to, com to target as compilation. So you can build uh, like more restricted DSLs, uh, which are going to be less expressive and more easy to reason about. But then you can have a, a formally verified compiler to your language, and it's, it'll be easier if your language can do, any, uh, can do everything. All right. Ah, Pierre? No? Well, yeah, I have a question about the, the ecosystem of our blockchain. There is not one single blockchain, there are several updates, and I think it's also a level of decentralization which is good to have. And so my question is, well, what, 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 what exists and what needs to be done so that uh, uh, um, blockchain <coughs> can live in an ecosystem of them? Do you have uh, what, so your question is, what needs to be done for blockchains to exist in an ecosystem? So I'm not... Or to interact one with another. Oh, to, okay. To, uh, to interact with one another. So uh, there are a few projects which are really focused on interoperability between blockchains. Uh, I can think of two. One is Cosmos, and the other one is um, Polkadot. So Cosmos uh, is trying to create the internet of blockchains. So have many, many blockchains that will talk to each other. And the way they do that is that they have this consensus algorithm, which is um, <laughs> tenement, very close to traditional uh, BFT agreements. Uh, and that also makes it easy to port proofs of consensus from one chain to another. So it's easier to pass state around between different, uh, different blockchains. Uh, so that's one approach. The other one is Polkadot, where they just have one big blockchain. And then, uh, so it's a blockchain that does kind of adjudication. So people run their own blockchain, and then they put hashes of their blocks, and then someone can challenge a transition. And then they have a, a WebAssembly version of the transition function of the blockchain, and then they show where there's an error in the trace of the, uh, of the transition. So it's pretty heavy machinery, but you, you, in some sense, you get, a lot of, uh, you get a lot of sharding for free. Everyone runs their own blockchain, and then if there's any error, you go on the Polkadot blockchain and say, like, there was an error here. Like, that transaction was invalid, and here's why. So these are different approaches. I'm less excited about interoperability because, so, why do you need different blockchains? And a reason why would be that there are trade-offs in the design of blockchain, right? If there's a way of designing a blockchain for healthcare a certain way, and then a way of designing a blockchain for a lettuce another way, uh, then you don't want to do a blockchain that does both healthcare and lettuce because maybe you'll be bad at both. But the thing is, I think there are very few design trade-offs that exist in this space. There are solutions which are generally better in almost uh, every dimensions uh, you can take. So the real trade-offs that I can think of are there's a trade-off between, like a, that exists in any system, between liveness uh, and, uh, um, uh, sorry, between uh, liveness and safety, right? So if you want to continue uh, at all time, every time, sometimes, you know, your system might not be safe. Uh, so that's, uh, that's potentially a, a problem. And right now, most of the choice that most of the blockchains made, including Tezos, is liveness. Um, you have a trade-off between decentralization and throughput. You know, obviously, if you want to be processing millions of transactions per second on one blockchain, you're not going to have a whole lot of people just running it on their laptops. Uh, so those are real, uh, those are real uh, trade-offs. I think there's also one between uh, like how underground do you want to be uh, versus how uh, mainstream uh, do you want to be. So th those are real trade-offs that exist, but there's not a whole lot of other 
that, 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 that's, that was my question. Do you think there will be a thing? No, I, 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 I think in the future we. I mean, there will be a lot, but I, I because there's a long tail for everything, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the ones that the ones that matter, uh, I think they will be uh, maybe uh, no ten years from now. I think four or five. How about other projects like Beast Chain and Holo Chain? Yeah. I haven't really followed Beast Chain and Holo Chain. And Hashgraph? Uh, Hashgraph, I read their paper. Uh, so they tried to uh, get common knowledge by, uh, uh, like, basic, basically gossiping about gossiping. Like, I got a message from this one, and now I got a message, and you got a message from this one, and you build a tree like this, and you get consensus. Uh, the thing is, is like, okay, so, you know, why not? Uh, Hashgraph has a peculiarity of, I think, uh, their stuff is patented or, or, or copyrighted, and, uh, you know, I, I guess it's neat. I don't think it's what makes a difference uh, in this environment. There's many, many consensus algorithms. Your consensus algorithm needs to be fast enough and it needs to work. Uh, it's a vast design space. So I don't think that it's... Uh, I don't think that having a better consensus algorithm than anyone else is going to be a killer feature when 99% when of this stuff, maybe not hash graph, 99% of this stuff is uh, open source uh, and open research. Okay, it's two hours. The, the camera is two hours. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you.